fantastic speaker and a fantastic human being i would say personally have known her and i feel that she has been um, i would say a source of energy for all of us a source of uh, you know a purpose for all of us just to give you a little background of zainab she was born in mumbai and she is one of the first few petitioners who ultimately came against the national legal services authority and union of india for the transgender rights and she holds an mba in hr and as a last stint she was also working with one of the largest multilateral organizations undp focusing on human rights and health issues she was a national manager for health and human rights for the undp country office in india um she has also worked in various other sectors including private institutions as well as government bodies and also working with various ngos and csos and um, she is a woman i would say as i said she is a woman of great purpose and conviction uh, currently she is with kpmg focusing on their dni strategy making sure that kpmg as a large organization remains true to its core as well as become inclusive business and uh, she is leading that uh, piece so zaina we are very very happy to have you join us we look forward to having this conversation with you and specifically the topic of many biases because i'm sure who the best person for you to address that because i'm sure uh, you would have faced many of those challenges all of us do but we would like to hear from your story from your journey um, what were those biases and challenges you faced and how did you overcome it more so important in terms of how do we face it um in the today's uh, webinar we have both men and women and all of us go through certain kind of you know perceptions certain kind of preconceived notions biases it's human nature but the main challenge is how do we recognize them and how do we address them over to you zana very very excited to hear you today thank you sarika and i think one more point that i should really commend beyond diversity is that um, so today as i lead kpmg in their ind agenda and that's also primarily thanks to sarika and rashmi who made sure that my cv reached the right person who then took the initiative to get me on board and all of this within eight working days so <laughs> i know so, the fastest hire it could have happened <laughs> it was the fastest lateral hire probably in the history of kpmg so so thank you again um sarika and uh, this topic is actually very close to my heart for a very simple reason that in all of my 30 38 years of existence both as a person as a human being as a coworker as a woman as a transgender person we encounter and also pass on bias you know and this is famous um, one line that i said you know biasness and attitudes are like body fat the older you grow the more difficult it is to get rid of that but wola today you also have liposuction so we will attempt uh, we'll use this session as a liposuction uh, session to kind of talk about some of the biases that we face and also probably in some way because all of you all you know are the best uh, judges and best uh, interventionist when it comes to dealing with bias because nobody can actually step into your shoes because each one of us deals with a particular situation in a particular way but there are some common coping strategies and common impact mitigating strategies i think which we can share and as i share my journey and a little bit of an academic presentation that i have so probably talk about the presentation bit for some time and then probably talk about my story and how i have learned to overcome some of the inherent bias that is sent that is directed towards me but at the same time that is um, also directed by me towards other people so uh, now that i have taken up a new role as a um, uh, as one of the di leads in india let me get on with my story so just a little bit of the presentation that i probably um, um zainab you need to just put the shares the screen share screen your screen sharing is stopped there's a button in the below yes we are getting your screen if you go just open your presentation yes so you know when when i actually talked about this entire journey about um, biasness so i thought about it is it is it only about biasness and tackling it 
tackling mm -hmm. a small portion of the work that we do or whether it actually makes a sense of belonging and um, more than the sense of belonging our shared responsibility and that's how i decided to title my presentation as you know creating a shared a sense of belonging at work and for each one of us i think we've been all been blessed with individual body individual minds individual personality traits and to be able to bring all of that to work is not only the impetus of the individual but all of us as colleagues as employees as supervisors as supervisees or in terms of support staff to create this environment where everyone is able to bring themselves to work so i guess um, all of you probably familiar with the slide not in terms of the diagrammatic representation but in terms of the message that is con you know ki kind of can be um, passing on and um, you know i was in a um, conference the other day and someone asked me you know um, is it being is it worth being good or is being bad good enough so i think the question that the, the larger philosophical part that i wanted to address is that if you have a lot of homogeneous thinking people if all of you think similarly i mean we are able to address a problem but not in the same kind of rigor and vitality as someone with a diverse group of people in it and <coughs> this information with a biblical story it said that in the old testament of the bible there was a story of a group of men from all parts of the world at that point of time people spoke a common language they tried to attempt building a tower to reach god so they were trying to build this tower to reach god and they were fairly successful and then at some point of time god thought that man needs to be taught a lesson and he sends down a lightning bolt that displays the power and also gives people the ability to talk in different languages so the idea was that if you are homogeneous in that nature but man started building other ways of reaching god so the idea was that groups with greater diversity are research wise able to prove and solve more complex problems better and faster than homogeneous so if ever probably me and sarika trying to do a weight loss program together we would probably not achieve that much result compared to a group of maybe say 10 other people who brings in different body types different personality different go to approaches rather than the similarity of thought processes that i and sarika share so the question is why does the problem of biasness persist Each one of you in your individual organizations or or in your work or personal spaces have been able to somehow or the other, you know, gone through targeted sessions on bias and what it leads to and how it should be mitigated or what are the kind of coping strategies that we have. <coughs> and I I came across this very interesting uh, piece of information where it says that the brain receives more than a billion piece, bits of information. a uh, per minute but we the brain is only conscious of third conscious and aware and process about 30 so the question is if the brain is able to short circuit all of the other bits of information and is only conscious and aware of 30 these kind of attitude resulting practices and behaviors have a result on the way how we interact how we how we interplay in our personal lives in our professional lives and in shared working spaces also from a matter of fact i went came to asking me you know if i were to cut down the chase and ask people what is it specifically that's going on if i take about me as a social cultural person uh, an a sexual minority person in india you know that we also know that minority groups are not broken they are not fragmented they are, they are very much compact very much diverse and very much alive and that all majority groups are not the enemy so when you actually look at it from the perspective this is the kind of the most true common biases that we have that we always think that minority groups are always broken fragmented and majority groups are perhaps always the enemy so these are the two most common things that you would come across so whether you take it in the in the grounds of say sexual diversity whether it talks about um lgbtiq persons persons who are against heterosexual persons or gender non conforming person this will always be the kind of issues that you would face also in terms of you know the societal bias all of us fortunately or unfortunately are part of a society that's how we've survived all of these years so there is an element of societal bias which is both again shared by women and men 
and it also manifests itself in technical and working cultures. Like for example, uh, when I when when I was based in Bangkok for about four years, you know, we always keep pride of the way we cook and the way our food smells, etc. And uh, we always kind of tend to look down sometimes upon cuisines from the uh, from from the from East Asia, from Southeast Asia, and uh, you know, we the stronger. Yeah, whether it's bamboo shoots or it's pork or it's some kind of other meat or uh, extremely fragrant uh, roots, uh, aromatic roots, etc. So we tend to kind of have a divergent view of and perceive how these things are. And we always feel proud that, you know, Indian food is good and smells great and awesome. And there was this one Ramadan, which I was there and I decided to make biryani and the biryani fumigated the entire system. And I, I ended up paying 10,000 rupees as a fine. But the fact is that all of us, and, we, and I realized that day, uh, the hard way, that biases are inherent, biases are common. Sometimes we might tend to think we aren't biased and we might actually say we aren't biased, but in practice, we actually tend to do that. And the end line is we know what to do and should act to take action together. So that for me are these four uh, things which I kind of believe in when it comes to just um, biases between the majority and the minority community. So if I actually look at the how this impacts us is we carry these unconscious bias to works day in and day out because that is how somehow we are programmed because our brain functions like that because the way we have been brought up this is the way how we continue in our in some of our passive active, um, passive active actions that we take uh, and because this goes unchallenged this, because we refuse to unlearn from what we have learned over a period of years this kind of results in either subtle dynamics at the workplace and not so subtle also because there are there are times when we are pretty uh, so there was this one time in my previous organization we were talking about language barriers and at that point of time people thought that or people accepted that hindi is a is a national language and it's acceptable but another regional language, which is also made it to the list of, of official languages, should not be spoken or used as much in, uh, in the official working space. So sometimes a subtleness in the bias manifests itself as not so subtle behaviors. These changes the dynamics at work. Also, what comes up as individual or explicit bias also kinds of results in institutional barriers towards access. So I think when it comes to us, we are, we are not only limiting ourselves to being an individual or an employee, but has larger implications because of these biases, which result in how the society works and functions, because ultimately we are part of the society. So, so what, what causes this bias? You know, as I was saying that when, a, when the brain receives about a million plus uh, bits of information and short circuits the rest, and is only conscious and aware of possibly the 30. So we all take these kind of short circuit or schema as we now know, because that makes sense to our world. You know, that's how we've been neurologically programmed. But sometimes the way we take these kind of shortcuts, you know, we, we, we have this thing that the moment you heat utensil with milk, you know, your mind automatically programs you to tell you not to pick it up with your bare hands. And even if the vessel is not um, hot, we sometimes tend to lift our hand in the fear of it, you know, getting burnt or whatever. But so that the issue is that sometimes these shortcuts that we take, the way our, we are neurological program, the way we, our societal bringing, upbringing, the way our personality tra uh, traits are, these shortcuts sometimes help us make forcibly misinterpret things or miss things. So this is the kind of unconscious bias that I have. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples on this one. So if we, if we kind of look at um, a female call, and apologies to all the male uh, audiences in this session, because I, I thought about bringing this up from a female perspective. So, you know, the, sometimes you meet, uh, you see someone, a woman on the street, and then you say, are you here with your boyfriend? You meet um, 
an effeminate gay person or an effeminate person who has an inclination towards art or wears flashy clothes and another question that you may ask is are you a designer um you know of, often that um, we we use a whole set of examples like these so of uh, when we sometimes tend to address another male colleague we always say obviously you would know this or um i think you may know this when it comes to referring to a particular colleague who may come from a region or from a particular religious background or a economic status or an educational background and uh, we often also tend to use this thing i didn't think it was offensive or you shouldn't get offended by these so some of these statements that i would try to uh, you know use i also happen to work um, in a call center uh, in my early days of college and this was a nevada us based call center and we were handling the india operations for that and um, we were taught to speak with an accent so that the customer couldn't really figure out whether he was talking to an american citizen um servicing them from america or an outbound call uh, center in india servicing them and sometimes due to language uh, gaps etc we the customer would say can you please put me on to someone who speaks english so i think there are some of these biases which came out very um very strongly and sometimes also subtly um so what are you then supposed to do in this situation do we let biases go unchallenged sometimes do we laugh at it and say you know we have this typical um indian tendency if i may use this word of says are wo to waisa hi hai ya ye usko to aisa samajh mein hi nahi aata hai ya this is not this is just how it is so are we do we do that do we take cognizance of the situation do we challenge it or do we take it to the next level of intervention and do we decide to go to the root cause or we just use the bandaid approach in reaching out and challenging this un these biases so um in so i would basically stop at this but um also share some of my personal experiences with you and that's that's also the reason why sarika requested me to speak on this session is in a way i have challenged every known bias and i'm going to list out those biases to you and say how i dealt with it both at an individual interpersonal level as well as in an organic level so the first thing that we do and when we comes to people at work we tend to prejudge we often tend to prejudge them right based on the way they dress the way they look the way they talk most of your decisions about the person's personality is made in the first 5 to 10 seconds um uh 5 5 to 10 seconds of your interaction with them so typically when i um and i do this to embarrass my chro uh, unmesh pawar that when he saw me and when he um saw my cv actually my cv has been a pretty much of a development cv because i came from the area of social development i worked with the united nations for about 10 years talked about land rights right to information lgbt health etc and when rashmi happened to send in my cv to him and i i and he shortlisted me and selected me for this position short circuiting a lot of the other processes i um i often give this example saying that uh you know about 10 12 years ago there was a movie called pardesh which got released and it had mahima choudhary who played the role of ganga and she was a supermodel at that point of time and she gave a um, a tv interview post the release of the film and she was dressed in all of her um, uh, western finery and she said that you know this is how i am and when mr ghai saw me he could see the ganga in me and that is the kind of example that i would give in when it came when it comes to recognizing talent and uh, possible um, growth that my when my boss saw me he could see beyond the development cv he could see beyond the human um, the human rights um, umbrella that i worked in that this is a person who could probably bring in value irrespective of her gender identity so i am a transgender woman i have completed my transition both in terms of surgical and legal transition so my name is actually zainab patel and i identify and have a marker as a woman 
So for to bring in someone from that kind of experience, so I belong to the tra transgender digital community. I feel very proud of it that someone within my community has been able to break the barriers and go on to become India's first transgender director, probably not only in India, in the region and probably in the globe as well, that a person from me, from my humble background, is able to be seen and projected as a senior leadership in the firm and being positioned as a director. Uh, so that itself takes your foresight and to have to be able to have that foresight, one actually requires that someone sees beyond the body, someone sees what beyond what is apparent. So with my that personal experience of that, I have battled with depression, I have battled with uh, body shaming, I have battled with with a name and the religious identity that goes with it. Like my name is Zena Patel. I actually come from a Roman Catholic family um, and I practice Sufism. I'm actually, I love Krishna and I practice Sufism, but my husband is a Muslim and I took on this name of Zena Patel. So when I moved back to Bomb India from Bangkok, uh, um, mid last year, I was desperately looking out for a location which was closer to my office and time. And out of the four locations that I saw, three outrightly rejected me because of my name. I don't want you to get into the communal aspect of what that means, but I'm sure all of you probably realize that I, I come from a minority background. The, the name at least looks like it comes from a minority background. And um, that was the kind of bias that I felt having access to housing. So something which all of us are privileged to have access to is something that I fought for over nine months to get access to decent, safe, equitable housing, in spite of being able to pay market rates available for the rent in that particular area. When it comes to challenging the bias in the education system, I, I hold a master's degree in human resources. Let me be frank, I did not study because I did not do my master's because I wanted to be a master's. I did it for a simple reason to be able to sit and compete with others where if you want to progress in life, the only kind of marker is, do you have a master's degree? And very frankly, nobody even asked me this question. Do you have a master's degree by distance education? Do you have a master's degree by regular? The fact is that I have a master's degree makes me eligible to run in the four runners for this position. But the fact is that I, in, in the kind of hijra community that I belong to, I've been out of house, dealt with suicidal tendencies, dealt with physical harm, dealt with sexual abuse, begged on the streets, sold sex also at a point of time because that was needed for survival. To be able to then make a very conscious choice that yes, the society is biased towards me. The society is going to box me. But at the same time, I will not have a savior to come and rescue me. So Zena Patel needs to become her own savior. And she therefore needs to study to break the barrier. So today, just like I am one of the directors for HR in my country, in my organization, I have another Yakshini who is a police sub inspector in Tamil Nadu. I have a Satya who is a practicing lawyer in, in, uh, in Southern India. I have a doctor who's an NSS who's transgender. We now have a young training pilot in Kerala. So I think all of us in our individual lives have been challenging the norm. One is to challenge yourself. And the second is to challenge the rules around you to be able to see that, yes, there are going to be biases. There are going to be attitudinal issues. There is going to be rampant discrimination and there is going to be violence. But the issue is from the larger good perspective. How do I stand up to, against all of this? I, ha I used to have a weight at one point of time. I was about 136 kilos and suffering from depression, anxiety. Uh, but the question is that I also decided to work on that, not because of what my colleagues or what my friends thought, okay. just in order to keep myself happy, have a healthier life. So in, in short, there have been a lot of biases that we have come across. And I'm going to take you to a couple of slides with just a few questions and probably a few pointers in terms of what do what I mean, are the of the last time um, Suma, can you please un, uh, mute yourself? 
uh, there is one uh, suma uh, person who has thing please mute yourself mm -hmm. thank you so so when we when i actually started asking me these questions about personal biases it's it's not that i did not have biases against people it's been very challenging it's been very challenging to to first is identify the kind of bias sometimes we think all of us are very smart we talk about the right language but the fact is that all of us in a conscious or a subconscious way tend to dis have bias tend to be biased and sometimes also direct the biasness in some kind of stigma and discrimination so what are the some of the strategies you have tried when it comes to recruitment so when i was in undp for 10 years i also sat sat in the recruitment board for a simple reason they thought it was it's it's great to have a transgender person to be on the board because she would probably look at um, certain um, certain issues certain people certain marginalized communities so when i was on the recruitment board i would ask some of the most unconventional questions and basically um behavioral event interviews uh, format because i would not go from the usual competency based assessments that we do so i would basically ask a person because the un was supposed is supposed to be a multicultural multi ethnic environment how does one work say with a colleague who's a self identified gay man or uh, comes from an ethnic religious group which prohibits a lot of intermingling between the male and female sexes or someone who comes from a totally different geographic area so we would try to focus on a behavioral event interview format trying to see whether the person in the past has been able to deal with this also the fact is that sometimes we also are biased from a perspective that we want to positively discriminate against a person to bring someone on board those kind of biases are definitely welcome where we are trying to get some certain sections of marginalized communities come on board to various interactions etc so what have been so i think the successes around a recruitment where you trying to use a behavioral inter, uh, inter event interview format is that it allows you to probably unravel an event or a behavior which cannot be scripted as per the competencies uh, listed in your job profile so i basically thought about that the, what have been the challenges is um, the li time limit of your interview so if you are interviewing like six people in a day and you just have 30 40 minutes each a behavioral event interview trying to unravel some of the biases may not work because it is more time heavy and sometimes you you the person might not open up or your sequencing in terms of the interview questions may not come in at the right or the opportune moment for the person to come up and give a real time um explanation to a particular issue what are some of the strategies that i've tried to address biases at work the first thing is that i made sure that my grievances as an employee um were particularly raised these issue like for example in my past uh, work i'm i'm too new to kpmg to actually talk what is some of the biases that i would probably face over here so long as uh, so far they have been extremely good with me but in my previous jobs in the four jobs that i did i think some of the inherent biases was having access to a washroom now for example a lot of people take it for granted that having a segregated washroom as in a male and female washroom takes care of every other issue and i remember from an interaction with a colleague and when i was in this past organization we were trying to see whether our washrooms are accessible for people who are differently able so that meant adjusting the length of the toilet seat having a uh, pulleys etc and they said said no we cannot do it for a few people so we had to turn around and said that is precisely the reason why you need to do it because among the 100 people who probably use it four people are not able to use it and hence are inconvenienced because of that so for someone like me who who when i was transitioning as a woman um had extreme difficulty in say using the washroom i actually stopped drinking water or started consuming very little water 
and most of my water requirements in the day would come into probably six cup of tea or whatever, so that I did not feel the need to access a washroom. So I think this is an extreme example, but a lot of people think that you need to look at the washroom as an extension of whatever is guaranteed <laughs> environment to be able to use. What is the second most uh, common bias that I've been able to address? The fact that people think that um, if you have a Muslim sounding name and a Hindu sounding surname, then you're definitely the case of love jihad. So when I started my passport application on the new gender identity and name that I had chosen, this was a question that was asked to me in police station. So, so from my previous name, which was a Catholic name, why did I only choose the name of Zainab and Zainab Patel? So unfortunately, the person did not know that you also had Muslim Patels. But he asked me, why did I choose the name Zainab Patel? And is this a case of love jihad? So I had to actually go, go, go and get a letter from my landlord, say that the person knows. But at the same time, is this is also inherent in some of our interactions with people. When Section 370 was removed, was abrogated in our country, a lot of people ask me, what is my personal opinion on Section 370? Well, what my personal opinion on Section 370 did not matter because as a, as a democratic country, we took a sovereign decision to abrogate Section 370. But just because people thought that I am an articulate person, I have an opinion and I have a Muslim sounding name. So my opinion on Section 370 also mattered. So I think this, this also kind of works in the larger system. So when I was in, um, in Bangkok, we, we worked with a lot of ethnic groups. Some of the ethnic groups also found, um, found representation in our staff structure. So when it came to ethnic representation, we, we tried to think about what is the best way to uh, address that. But more often than not, all of our celebrations, all of our activities, all of our mailers, all of our market information, are so geared towards the mainstream and the and those in majority that people who are like for example i come from mumbai but my ethnic roots are in mangalore and in some of the celebrations that we see at the workplace or beyond it is so north india dominated that for us to look at regional celebrations or say that this is not for me this event or this festivity is good but I don't see how I or myself or my regionality or my festivities ever find itself in. And that's how we, we are now at KPMG trying to revamp the way we understand multiculturalism and how do we uh, res, uh, you know, reduce some of the inherent biases around multiculturalism. And for me personally, when I was asked in a conference a couple of days ago, I thought that yes, LGBT, yes, PWD will continue to remain major drivers of the IND agenda. But for me, coming from the current socio-cultural uh, religious scenario in my country, I think multiculturalism will emerge as a single largest agenda in the next three years. So when it came to working with unrepresented groups, I just feel that if it is, if you are going to be working either with people who come, who represent scheduled cars, scheduled drives, other, other backward classes or people from different minority groups or regions, say for example, the North Lead or ethnic groups from the, from the area, all of them bring a unique sense of culture to work. The question is that, are we ready as an organization? Are we ready as a, as a human capital workforce to be able to embrace this diversity and to be able to fully take on the challenges that come with it and propel forward? Or are we going to continue to remain biased? Are we going to continue to remain bigots or are we going to continue to remain silent bystanders and expect the next few years to change as it is without us making any investment in it? So when I, I, so fortunately for me, uh, my, the surname that I chose is a Patel. So Patel is definitely, uh, comes from not, a, a, it, it does feature in the list of dominant classes. And especially if you are, 
part of the discourse in Madhya Pradesh, if you're part of the discourse in Rajasthan, um, certain parts of Rajasthan and definitely Gujarat, you will see a huge Patidar Andolan. So for fun's sake, I also joined one of the uh, discussions to see what has been some of the inherent biases around this. And I personally felt that when we look at it from a caste-based angle, a dominant caste-based angle, we realize there are certain things that come to us as privileges, very difficult to quantify. But let me tell you, um, when I visited Bharuj, which was my husband's hometown last year for our anniversary, we saw the entire area segregated on, um, on Uttarayan day, which is a day for far flying kites in Gujarat. So 14th of January. And when we saw this, we saw automatically saw groupism within people. So people who kind of, belong to a similar caste matrix flying their own and when I asked them that why don't we do it together or we cut another kite and they said if you cut another kite from another caste or another religious um, denomination group you will then this will situation will then lead perhaps to a, a riot like situation. Um, this is a question that I keep get asking get kept get asked so many times. What is it that I might do if someone tells me that I'm exhibiting biases? So, uh, you know, when, when we started championing for the LGBT, sorry, uh, for the LGBT agenda and people said that what happens to the rights of heterosexual people and aren't you kind of displaying a too much of a biasness towards um, the minority community and how do you then protect the rights of the majority community? So I think at that point of time, so this was one example which I thought and we we actually celebrate diversity in many ways. We, we see that in our culture, we see that in our upbringing, we see that in our religions. But the question is one needs to take a real time stand, a self evaluation of the bias that has been brought up and actually look at it in the context of which we have been exhibiting it. Like for example, a, a lot of us people in India are food Nazis. We have uh, we have a very peculiar taste, very peculiar food likings and anyone who doesn't adhere to the norm is de definitely called out, ostracized, etc. So I think when it comes to this stage, when someone confronts you that you have been exhibiting a particular type of bias and this bias needs to be addressed, one needs to look at multiple levels. One is that, is this something which is which is a problem. And I think one needs to do a self-righteous evaluation of this thing. Is it causing, is it causing harm? Is it causing hurt? Is it hurting sentiments? Is this kind of bias that is exhibited by me and practiced by me affecting systemic issues? Is it causing an institutional barrier? And furthermore, does it disturb the existing work culture or home culture or a friend, uh, the societal structure that we work in. So with these kind of evaluation, one need to say that, okay, this, this is question is targeted towards me. Not that I have dealt with all of my biases. I still have so many biases, which I deal with on a work day to day basis. This also come up, comes up because of insecurity, because of the particular backgrounds that I come for because of my uh, so-called religious status. But these are, these are the fact is that I am happy to note that these biases are present. This is going to be work in progress because no one can very effectively says post one session on stigma, discrimination or subconscious bias, I am going to set myself free and the work around me and I'm going to be a change process. Change starts with the very fact that we, we begin to acknowledge. Yes, there is an issue that, that, that is part of the way I deal with people. I need to start working on it one day at a time. Thank you, Sarika, for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm going to take a pause right now and probably open up the, the floor for questions. Or, or Sarika, if you have some questions to, for me to answer, I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you so much, Zainab. It was fantastically uh, well articulated, I would say. How you faced different biases, both outwardly as well as ones which you have exhibited at your own level. And how some of those biases, which was negative in certain aspects, but actually turned as positive in other aspects. So how do we ultimately challenge them, overcome them, and make sure that we are more inclusive in behavior? I will uh, like to leave this uh, forum open for any questions. 
if you have any questions you can put it onto the chat box or raise a hand i can unmute you um so feel free to open up zainab i have known zainab for two years and trust me when i was in this journey of also understanding so bias uh, whether it's in terms of disability or lgbt or whether it's in terms of uh, gender issues or any other things and uh, she has been very kind enough to answer all my questions without any inhibition and made me feel very welcome that no questions is uh, stupid enough or no question is embarrassing enough so please feel free um this is a safe forum if you have any questions please feel free to um, ask them right now is anybody um, um asking any questions or nancy would you like to unmute everyone and see if anybody has any questions secondary and higher education students hello brother so they don't know basically what they are true in the future so the kind of psychometric assessment online is there adanna assess maadi okay you are good in that you can go to this career anta consider madadu so i have a question for zainab just a second guys um, could you just raise your hand as, as soon as you are unmuting yourself introduce yourself and then ask the question little slowly um, otherwise we are missing the uh, thing in static thank you please go ahead okay thank you my name is mahima and um, my question to zainab is um so there are obviously a lot of people who uh, belong to the lgbtq community and um, how can uh, people from the other gender if they are willing to uh, you know i wouldn't say help because i am not even sure whether uh, the other community might need any help however how can we make people comfortable and um, and uh, do you really think that uh, one should be encouraged to come out of the closet and talk about their uh, preferences at preferences at work this is kind of a riddle for me so would you please share your view on that zainab zainab you need to unmute yourself so this is this is something that i'm dealing with at my organization as well so the, this is a perennial question which will come up but for me the answer is very simple all of us deal with a lot of stress because of work because of personal reasons which which kind of gets computed i wouldn't want my sexual orientation or gender identity expression to become one more stress level um addition to my life um at the workplace i expect people not to treat me differently but treat me with the same amount of respect and care and decorum that they would uh, they would expect people to do to themselves um when i started coming out uh, at my workplace i did not we did not have any protective environments we did not have any employee resource groups at work we did not have policies uh, protecting um, discrimination uh, against discrimination we did not have any policies um covering insurance and i know the struggle that is that i face but i was also an activist so i wanted to come out at work i wanted people i was outed because i was already on television people knew about my background people knew the work that i was doing so i did not have an option but for a lot of people coming out is a lifelong struggle and there is no one particular event that you can point out and say okay at the age of 21 is perhaps the right time to come out or at 22 it would be the right time to come out or somewhere at 40 is the right time to come out unfortunately because we live in such a society where sexuality is often a very repressed subject coming out can be triggered by various reasons so if your if your workplace is friendly if you have allies um that sends out a very positive message that come what may um, so earlier i did not believe in the power of merchandise like the pink like the rainbow pin but now as i started working from the last two years in the private sector i realized that just having a rainbow flag having a rainbow pin having a badge that states that you're an ally sends out such a positive message to someone who is who's probably struggling with their own sexual identity gender identity or any kind of issues of our culture and environment religious environment it sends out such a positive that yes i might not need help today i might not need an intervention now 
but that the fact is that someone in my office is available for me as an ally someone will be available for me to talk to me to support me be be a buddy should i ever need that the offer to support help is constructed in many ways i think what we are doing is helping develop a better work environment so at least when when i stand up as an ally i might not necessarily give a great speech or bit, but the fact is that that silently flying rainbow flag at my desk that metallic pin on my on my jacket or on my skirt or on my on my top sends this example out that yes i am available for you you decide the time and place of your convenience to come out we will make sure that the environment is ready to accept you at that point i'm not sure whether it answered the question but uh, the question is that yes i would make sure that my colleagues are open are sympathetic and are as understanding to a person of a different of the same gender or same sex preference or a different gender as much as they would do to their other heterosexual colleagues so that's very beautifully put uh, zaina i mean as i said it is not our responsibility to out everyone but it is our responsibility to be an ally and to be a supportive person and have a listening ear in case if someone wants to talk to you in fact many managers come back and say that some person has confided in me is it my responsibility to ultimately report it to hr until unless that person is specifically given you that permission you are not supposed to speak about it to anyone and therefore the sensitizing of the managers and the people's managers uh, specifically on this issues have become very very imperative because post the legal changes uh, there are many many such conversations which are taking place in many organizations and sometimes if not handled empathetically if not handled sensitively it can actually boil down to a very big issue so sure. yes it's very important to face it uh, and sensitize people and also look at it what are the next steps and some of these uh, things needs to be articulated to the people managers very effectively yes that sarika that that, oh, that also takes me to my next point is when we understand the concept of shared confidentiality so there are often people because you're a people's manager people will come and confide certain things to you and also because if if by chance you are also a dni spoke by any chance you will also have or an hr bp for that matter people are going and going to come and confide at some point of time to you you need to be a better judge of the information which is available because one is that it is restricted and confidential information all of your organization policies have to protect this kind of confidentiality when it comes to a personal details or demographic details or sexual orientation religious kind of status details with you these these are restricted information so you have to be the better judge as an hr spoke or a hr bp or a people's manager how are you going to deal with this and will the disclosure of this information result in the the issue that is being discussed will it lead to elevation or will it lead to further compounding of that com concerns that are coming up thank you so much zaina for sharing do we have any other question please unmute yourself and you can ask the question so we have one question in the chat box we will take that uh, zaina first uh just a second i am trying to open the chat box so jagdeshwari mentioned how do you measure success of dni yes. policy in an organization so not to be too forward thinking but because i lead dni from kpmg i think the biggest uh, measure of success is not an external benchmarking of how you would describe the number of policies do i do i as a organization do better than a deloitte or an accenture or a mahindra and mahindra or a godrej it's not in terms of the bouquet of services that you offer it is also in terms of access and uptake of these and i think the ups, uh, the access and uptake of these services are internal benchmark indicators for you as an organization because no one can set it apart from you you may have the best policies but you may have no uptake of it or no access or limited access to it the second thing is that uh, for me because i come from the social development field this is something that we that we think very often is a uh, knowledge attitude behavior practices and because uh, you know when we do dni benchmarking 
we tend to see what is the best of the best standard in the industry and we say okay my organization versus the best standard in the industry and let me pitch myself but often because this doesn't have scientific rigor is does it reflect the climate at your workplace does it reflect the actual issues coming up so for example um, if your people if you if you have a people survey all of you have basically people surveys in the organization however way you want to cut it does it reflect the diversity in the organization does it reflect does it is it able to capture and capture effectively concerns around say culture religion sexual orientation um, work styles abilities um, language and if your if your people survey is able to tell you a little bit of the dynamics whether it gives you a slice of the pie as an individual as a business unit or as the industry as a whole for you it gives you a very solid ground for you to plan the dni policy which is truly reflective of your organic culture rather than truly reflective of what is the best in the industry culture and i think right now people are realizing that that race for, for performing better is not really impacting because you can be the best of the best in the industry in terms of offering but if your employee at the end of the day still feels disgruntled still feel unhappy still feels insecure then there's a need to revise the policy to reflect the ground reality so i would actually say two things one is that look at the access and uptake that is the best judge for you in terms of the dni policy a uh, benchmarking framework the second thing is that look at an ingrown organic culture and use that as the baseline indicator for for deciding what is going to be your dni direction and strategy very well uh, put uh, zana um, any other any other question we have another 5 minutes before we wrap up <coughs> So it seems uh, we don't have any other question right now. Anything on the chat box or okay? So Zainab, I have one question for you, uh, and this is a question which we are getting in uh, many uh, uh, organizational DNI strategies. Is initially, of course, everybody was speaking about women issues, the gender issue as they call it, but of course, gender is no longer binary. And now, of course, after the Section three seventy seven, people have started talking about uh, the what you call. uh are um, lgbt issues and then of course cultural and regional and religious or the other stuff coming in how do people align all of these because lot of what has happened is that it is one step forward and two steps backward in many times so a lot of organizations are facing a challenge that by speaking too many of these issues or by speaking too much of the biases you are actually making people feel afraid and worried about either having that kind of a person in within the team or being open about it and having a good feedback com uh, conversation or uh, following a metrics to the level that we want these 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 kind of diversity and eventually not looking at meritocracy there are a lot of you know them there are a lot of these kind of naysayers who are coming up with reasoning how do a stakeholder specifically a dni strategy person or a business leader who is wanting to push this agenda how would you suggest that you uh, combat these naysayers okay first of all let me just start off with this thing that we we kind of invested and sarika you have invested all a, a large portion of your life in combating our you know meritocracy versus you know the actual inclusion and you know from your own examples in terms of the work that you've been doing with corporate and the mentorship thing that diversity is natural you know nature is diverse but inclusion is always a choice that we make right. so irrespective of whether we choose to acknowledge a woman irrespective whether we choose to acknowledge an lgbt person irrespective whether we choose to acknowledge people with different abilities or culture or religion or multi gen we know that your workplace is has always and will continue to include these people you know so the question now is that do i turn a blind spot so when it came so i give let me give a an outlandish example but i let me so when the nirbhaya case happened you know because of poli, because of media traction because of this change you know charged environment there were a lot of rape cases that were reported 
and people just said oh it's just that because of media surveillance that rape cases have started coming to the light the fact that harassment has always been happening it's just that you need that one fulcrum to change the axis totally so i think the fact is that when you sensitize people to an lgbt person to a people who is differently able you are not sending a wrong message i think you are sending the perfect message because your society for me today is the extension of your workplace so the part so for me if you turn to you turn a blind eye towards believing that my workplace only has heterosexual people then that 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 is a policy that you have to live with the fact is that tomorrow you realize that a differently able person can perhaps do better than you or compete in you know client facing operations is something that you will have to live with because when with the advent of artificial intelligence all of these biases will somehow get rooted out how will you then say that my biases cannot be taken care of by ai so that's how our increasingly reliance on ai is going to challenge some of these inherent biases in hiring in recruiting and somewhere the issue of meritocracy because see you can give jobs to people probably in support functions when it comes to that on the basis of maybe sympathy or empathizing but if you want a person to grow that is definitely you know fueled only by meritocracy so when it comes to you know looking at the bias you know the person is deserving to grow but because of his his or her gender because of his or her sexual orientation because of his or her differently able status or religion or age issue we tend to compute this and the fact is that if you if we as an organization or a culture or a workforce decide that this is something that is just a new frill that has come up and will fizzle out it will actually be your loss because people are realizing that a more diverse workforce is actually going to be the only propelling workforce today you are seen and i give this example very often there are a lot of requests for proposals when you are bidding for things your team dynamics your team diversity your dni actually now figures in the ranking criteria perhaps much more than it did 5 years and probably 5 years than the now it will be a very crucial deciding factor and that's where your business objective or business imperative lies in thank you so much and that's where my partnership option will also come from <laughs> no we definitely need to catch up for our cup of coffee we need to hear more from you uh, but thank you so much everyone and that's zana patel for you a uh, full of passion full of purpose full of really great ideas in terms of how you articulate your business imperative how you address the challenges of bias how do you overcome them and eventually become a better organization a better ecosystem and more importantly a better human being um thank you so much zainab it was a pleasure having you over and uh, we look forward to you know connecting again and doing much more and thank you everyone for joining us and have you know listening to this conversation we hope that you will be able to take some of these conversations back to your workplace share it with your team members share it with your colleagues share it with your family share it with your friends the webinar link along with the recorded webinar the youtube will be there um nancy and team will send an email as well as on whatsapp uh, feel free or else in few days you will find it in our youtube channel which is known as beyond diversity so thank you so much everyone and thank you zainab once again and we have a coffee date very soon thank you thank you bye bye